So next up, we have uh, Dr. Lisa Demetter and her computer. going to be balanced here. Okay. So let me get down here. This is just going to have to be just like that. Maybe, maybe they should put it like this, maybe. There. There we go. Oops. Is this the right one? Nope. That's later on today. I can pull it up there. Oh, yikes, this one, okay. I hope I don't get epilepsy. Because I was gonna try to present using a pointer here. Yeah. Oh boy, I can't. Sorry. All right, yep, we got it. All right, so probably don't stare at the screen, stare at that screen. Yeah, we have the offsite location, so I'm trying to use okay. the pointer. So, perfect. Oh, well. All right, please help me in welcoming Dr. Lisa DeVetter. Okay. All right. Well, good morning to you all. Um, I'm going to stand from behind the podium and try to use the cursor for our offsite locations because they can't see the laser pointer here. And it's flashing profusely, so I'm also going to hope not to go into an epileptic seizure when we're looking at this. Um, again, I'm Lisa Wasco DeVetter, small fruit horticulturalist here at the Northwestern Washington Research and Extension Center. Uh, thank you for organizers and to our organizers at both here and at our offsite locations, and greetings to our offsite locations for joining in on this workshop. So I'm a horticulturalist, and today I'll be giving two very different talks. And the first talk, this one here, focusing on nematode management, really is on the crop protection end of the spectrum when it comes to small fruit production. I want to acknowledge some of the other individuals that have been really involved in soilborne disease management research, and this presentation really is a synthesis of about eight years of nematode and other soilborne disease research that has been done by some of the individuals here on this screen. Uh, Inga Zazada being the first one that you see listed, she is a nematologist, plant pathologist, based at the USDA Ag Research Center in Corvallis. Uh, she presented the 30 minute version of this talk and we were fortunate to have another hour here to kind of delve through and go over some of the information that we have to share to growers and crop protection uh, specialists that are writing recommendations to growers. Also, we have Jerry Weilin, who is a plant pathologist located at the uh, USDA Research and Extension or uh, Egg Research Center in Corvallis. And then, last but not least, we have Tom Walters, uh, who you just heard of. And those three really were there at the beginning of this eight-year window doing the research. I arose later in 2014 and has been fortunate to work with this team in terms of trying to develop information and tools to help predominantly commercial growers with improving management of root lesion nematode. There's also other entities that have been involved and I wanna make sure that we recognize them. First, the Washington Red Raspberry Commission. They provided a lot of the support uh, funding wise to do a lot of these trials as well as the numerous growers that we have hosted, dozens of trials on their farms. Then there's countless people at the USDA and WSU research centers over the years that have helped with data collection. We also have DuPont and Bayer and other companies that have helped uh, with providing support for the post-plant nematicide trials, and then Trident Ag, who has also helped fumigate our small research plots and has always been there to give us information in terms of how the fumigation landscape is changing. So I'll begin by just giving some introductory information about nematodes. So Plant parasitic nematodes are the organisms that we're gonna be focusing on today. They are production limiting all over the world where we have red raspberry production. And the types of nematode present really depends on the location. 
There are two main ones that we are concerned about in the red raspberry system. That is root lesion nematode or Pratolenchus penetrans and dagger nematode. So let's learn a little bit more about these two nematodes. So root lesion nematode, also abbreviated as RLN, this is a migratory endoparasite. Uh, this means that it spends the majority of its life inside the roots feeding about 70%. Um, and that can make management a bit more difficult because we're dealing with an organism inside plant tissue as opposed to outside plant tissue for a large portion of its life cycle. Uh, the other one that we see less of but is some, a concern depending on the region, we don't have a lot of this in the Pacific Northwest, but that is dagger nematode. This is a migratory ectoparasite, uh, meaning that it spends its life outside of the raspberry root or outside of the plant root. Uh, the main concern with this particular nematode, though, is that it can vector viruses as it feeds, uh, particularly tomato ring spot virus. So I'm going to be referring to this slide quite a bit. Uh, this is a decision tool that Inga and I have spent a lot of time working on developing, and it really kind of walks you through the red raspberry uh, production cycle, and we are stopping along the way at various time points where you as a grower or crop advisor can make decisions that will impact nematode management. And a lot of this really is looking back at the biology in red raspberry that we've learned over the year and using the biology to influence and inform our decision in terms of how we manage it. So the first one is the decision to replant a field. And you really have two decisions there, to go to a new site or go to uh, stay at that same site. So crop rotation is kind of the time-honored tradition for managing soil-borne diseases. Unfortunately for root lesion nematode, it really is a difficult option. And that's because root lesion nematode has a very wide um, host range, about 300 different crops that it'll feed on. So rotating is a difficult strategy just in that regard. In addition to that, a lot of our raspberry ground is very limited, so we don't necessarily have the opportunity to rotate onto new ground and practice the strategy for soil-borne diseases in our systems. Uh, replanting on new ground, so it's just very difficult for a grower. What we can do, though, is we can collect samples and we can make informed decisions knowing a bit about our, pre our sample population. And that's where we're going to spend some time next is sampling for nematodes and looking at how do we interpret that information from those samples. So growers typically are looking at soil samples, oftentimes they're sending that to Evergreen and making interpretations from that. Uh, we as researchers look at both soil and root populations, and a lot of that is going to be explained here in this slide. Uh, root populations tend to be a bit more consistent than soil populations. Um, on this slide, what we're seeing here is on our y-axis, we're seeing root lesion nematodes per 100 grams of soil, and we're seeing root lesion nematodes on our x-axis per gram of roots. And these data came from some sampling that Jerry Weiland has done um, in 2013 and 2014. You can draw a line through that, and we have a relationship that's significant, although it's not very strong. But generally what this tells us is that if you have high populations of nematodes in the soil, you're likely going to have high populations of root lesion nematode in your root. However, there's some instances that make interpretation difficult, and that's when we have kind of these outliers where we have um, low populations in the root, but high populations in the soil. And this is also kind of indicative and represented here when we look at some sampling that Tom and Inga had done in 2008 and 2009, where if you compare these two time periods or these surveys, we see that um, our soil populations vary between 100 and 655, but our root populations are pretty consistent. And that's really due to the ephemeral nature of nematodes, of root lesion nematode in particular, spending part of their time in their roots and part of the times in their soil. So it's hard to know really we're sampling where they're going to be at that particular point in time. So the take home messages from this is that High populations in the soils are usually indicative that we're going to have high populations in the roots. Soil populations are more variable, and again, that's due to the femoral nature of nematodes. And soils type also matters, and I'll get into that a little bit later on here in this presentation. Now you get your sample from Evergreen. The next step is how do you interpret that, and what are the action thresholds for management? So this first table here, this is from Fred McElroy, 1992. 
I'm really going to spend time focusing on root lesion nematodes because that is one of the primary reasons growers fumigate. It's for this nematode, and we've learned that through various surveys over the years. Um, the action threshold in a pre-plant situation is 250 uh, nematodes per 250 grams of soil. In an established planting with a, that same soil sample, you're looking at 500 to 2,000. Um, in some of Jerry's samples, what was observed was about 30% of fields were in that proposed threshold. And we also were learning a little bit more that soil really influences the parasitism and the infection of red raspberry and the roots and the subsequent effects that you'll see. And so they've done some additional sampling over the years and they have some more refined, I would say, recommendations on action threshold thresholds based on the soil type where if you're looking at a sandy loam soil in a pre-plant situation, the recommended action threshold is 15 to 125, uh, just because lower populations in these types of soils tend to be more problematic. Um, and then if you're looking at a silt loam soil, 45 to 315 is your action threshold. So next, where I'm gonna be spending most of the time for this presentation is the pre-plant management techniques, because this is really where all the action happens when it comes to soilborne disease management, and that includes root lesion nematode. So we have field renovation, we have soil fumigation, and we have various decisions that you might want to consider when it comes to fumigation. And I'll go through that here in these next few slides. So field renovation, really the only few slides I'm going to present on that is a research trial that we did uh, looking at root removal. So if we go back and think about the biology of nematodes, we know that root lesion nematode spends about 70% of its life in the raspberry roots. So one of the questions that we had was if we remove these roots prior to fumigation, will that improve soil borne disease management? Because hypothetically or hopefully, we would be removing a large amount of that inoculum. So we did a trial up in Whatcom, Washington, where we went through a raspberry field. We had plots that we removed roots. We had plots that we didn't remove roots. Uh, this is what we're looking at here, where um, these are, this is what we removed and this is what we remained when we sift through the soil. Oops. Sorry about that. And then we had also plots where we fumigated with Tillone C35 and plots that we didn't. And we followed root lesion nematode populations over time and we looked at plant growth and development. So from that trial, we learned that root removal really has no impact on fumigation efficacy and had no effect on um, our root lesion nematode populations. What we did see was an impact due to fumigation. So fumigation reduced populations, root removal did not. And this was also supported in our measurements of plant growth and development as well as yield. So now let's focus a little bit more on soil fumigation. Uh, this is an area where the landscape has changed quite a bit over the years and is still changing. And I wanna go over, you know, if you're choosing to fumigate, what are the goals when you're fumigating? Well, the goal really is to not eradicate the nematodes or the soil worm pathogens. It's to reduce their population so that you give your plant a window to grow and establish itself so it is more competitive against parasitism and infection later on and you have a healthy planting and a productive planting for the life of that planting. You can really use knowledge of soil type and the pathogen load that we can learn from our soil sampling to inform your fumigation practices. Also, tarping. Tarping is something that if you're not using it, it's very unlikely that you're getting good control in those top three to four inches of your soil profile because that fumigant is not being retained in that shallow layer of the soil. And then regardless of the fumigator application, below the shanks where, you know, which would be 18 to 24 for um, our Tillone applications or nine with our Vapam applications, if you're getting below that, that zone, you're not gonna have very good control because the fumigant moves, doesn't move down through the soil profile from the shanks, it moves up. So I mentioned I was gonna talk about soil type and this is where I'm gonna be spending some time talking about how knowledge of soil type can tell us about where nematodes are in our soils and that subsequently can be utilized to think about how we're going to fumigate that field if that's our choice. So Inga and her graduate student Duncan did an experiment where they looked at how soil influence where nematodes are and fumigant efficacy. They sampled two soil types they looked at a sandy loam and a loamy sand, both in Whatcom County, and they sampled three feet deep 
pre fumigation post fumigation as well as at planting. And here's some of the data that they generated. So let's first take a look at the loamy sand. This is about 70% sand content. We have the sampling depth here on the y-axis, and we have the populations of root lesion nematode per 100 grams of soil. And then in the blue bars, we have uh, pre-fumigation, and in the orange bars, we have post-fumigation, and then gray, which you can't really see unless you go down to this slide, that's at planting. And then again, we have the same setup for our figures, only with a sandy loam where we have a lower sand content. And what I want to focus on is that with this high sand content after fumigation, when you look at the orange bars, it didn't really reduce the nematode populations as well as we would have liked, as opposed to the sandier loam where we have less sand content. And so really what we're learning is that these um, soils with less sand content does a better job at kind of keeping that fumigant down in the soil profile. So if we're thinking about these two field sites, we might go for a deep shank broadcast to loan application if that isn't, wasn't, is an option for us in this field. Whereas in this field, since the nematodes are shallower in the soil profile, we might want to go with a BAPAM application, which is applied shallower in the soil. Now let's again focus on soil fumigation. And really, we think of three key questions that a grower or a crop advisor might be asking themselves when they're going through and thinking about a fumigant or fumigation practice. Um, one is what compound to use and how are you going to apply it. The next is broadcast fumigation or bed fumigation. And then last decision is what are your options if you don't want to fumigate? And I'll go through these one by one. So the first question again is what compound to use and how to apply it. So here on this table is a list of the registered fumigants that can be used in red raspberry. And I'll start at the beginning or at the top here with Talone C35. This is about 60, this has 65% of 1,3-dichloropropene or 1,3-D, and then 35% chloropicrin. And the reason I'm telling you this is because 1,3-D is a nematicide. It's most effective against nematodes, whereas chloropicrin is more effective against fungi or fungi-like pathogens. So as we go through this table, you're going to notice that there's different, amount, different amounts of these two compounds and they impact the type of pathogen that you're going to be trying to control. So Talon C35, this is really targeted towards nematode control because of its high 1, 3, higher 1,3-D content. It's a product, where my cursor go, that growers are familiar with. A lot of growers in Whatcom County will bro have broadcast applied this in their fields, but there's some cons to it or some problems, and that is the concerns about buffer zones because of the chloropicrin content. And it's also not as effective against Phytophthora rubi or root rot pathogens. And I'm trying to find my cursor here. Another option we see less used in our red raspberry systems is Picclor. There we go. Um, this has, again, lower content of 1,3-D, higher content of chlorpicrin. Because of that mixture, it's more targeted towards Phytophthora rubi or fungi or fungi-like pathogens less so for nematodes because it has less 1,3-D. It also, we don't really have a lot of information on this particular theme again. Um, we haven't seen a lot of results on this to date and that will hopefully change this year. We have some research trials planned in Washington red raspberry systems. The next is KPAM or VAPAM. This is metam sodium or uh, metam potassium. These products are being used increasingly more by raspberry growers. They're inexpensive, they have smaller buffer zones, and they are broad spectrum. They are shallow injected so that they are able to get the nematodes at the shallower level, um, shallow layer of the soil profile depending on the soil top type. Um, however, you might lose that ability to control nematodes that are deeper in the soil profile. Um, one of the cons, no, and I'm, I'm going to have to apologize to our off-site location. I just can't keep on looking at the screen. It's just uh, flashing quite a bit. So I'm going to have to use the pointer here to walk through this. Um, so going back, KPAM, metam sodium, shallow injection. So you can get good control of nematodes higher in the soil profile, uh, but you might not have that level of control deeper in the soil profile. And we also don't have any commercial applicators. It's all growers that have their own rigs that can apply this particular product. 
Uh, basimid, desimid, we don't really see this a lot in our Washington red raspberry systems, although it is widely used in Canada. It's inexpensive, it also has smaller buffer zones and is a broad spectrum uh, fungicide or nematicide. Also no custom application available and control results have been variable with this product. A lot of it is really is how it's applied. And then lastly, a newer product is Dominus, which is an allele isothiocyanate. This material has smaller buffer zones, it's broad spectrum, but we have some questions about its mobility in the soil. It's also pretty expensive to use. That can be a bit of a barrier in terms of adoption if this is something to use. Um, and we have limited efficacy data on this product with red raspberry. So we also have some data that kind of informs in terms of why we have these pros and cons for these different types of compounds. So there's been experiments that we've done in 2014 and 2016 where we've looked at different types of fumigants on root lesion nematode management. Let's focus first on this table on your left. We have root lesion nematode um, per gram of root on our y-axis, and then we have different sampling dates on our x-axis. And the products that we tested in this experiment were VapePam, Dominus, and our typical application of uh, Tolone C35. And what was encouraging in this trial is that we look one year after fumigation, we have really good control with our VAPAM treatment relative to Dominus and Tolone. So for growers that are facing an issue where broadcast Tolone is no longer an application or available to them, we have other chemistries available that can achieve good control. In another trial, which was fumigated in September of 2015, this is a trial funded by the WSDA Specialty Crop Block Grant Program. We again have root lesion nematode populations on our, X, our Y axis and sample time on our X axis. We have our chemistries, Tolone C35, orange is Tolone C35 with a tarp. Then we looked at with the gray bars, Tolone C35 with a shallow application of VAPAM and Dominus. And the encouraging thing from this particular trial is that you know, even though we don't see a lot of statistical differences between these treatments, when we look at the scale from this, from our graph figure on our right to our figure on our left, we have low populations in general. And this was a field that previously had 3,000 uh, nematodes per gram of root. So all of these treatments achieved a good level of control in this particular trial. So we do have other options aside of Tolone C35, which is going to be important a little bit later if you don't, um, are not aware of the 1,3-D shortage. All right, so our next decision, after we've gone through the first one, is broadcast or bed fumigation. So some of you might be aware there's a shortage of 1,3-D. Uh, this particular product goes into the making of Talone, and Trident Agricultural Products is our applicator of this particular material, has stopped broadcast fumigation effective of 2017. Uh, so this has posed a bit of a challenge in terms of, you know, those growers that have typically broadcast fumigated with Talone C35, they now don't have that available, but what they do have available is bed fumigation with this particular product. Um, for those that haven't seen it, this is Trident's bed fumigation rig, and these are the sizes of their beds. Also what I wanted to show, since this is a, a bit of a change in terms of how many growers are fumigating their fields, I wanted to show just what Trident's uh, fumigation rig looks like and what it, it looks like when it's applying the material in the field. So just a, a short little video for you to see what this looks like being implemented in a commercial field situation. And what, again, what this um, equipment is doing is it's going over, it's pulling soil in from the outside and it's forming these raised beds. And while it's doing that, it's, an inject, it's injecting the fumigant in the soil. <clears throat> okay. So what are the pros and cons to bed fumigation? Because there are, there are those concerns that growers are expressing with this new strategy of applying to loan C35. Well, one of the pros of bed fumigation is that this is now really the only way you can apply to loan C35 because broadcast fumigation is no longer an option with Trident Agriculture product. 
and this mixture favors nematode control. Also, when you're applying through bed fumigation, you're reducing your buffer zones as opposed to when you're broadcast fumigating this particular product. And additionally, a question that has been asked with this particular practice is, if I'm just fumigating the beds, what's going to happen to the alleyways and will that be a problem with nematode management? We have not seen in the previous trials this to be an issue. And I'll go through some data that supports that. Some of the cons, Telone C35, it's great for nematode control, but it doesn't really favor fungi or oomyce control or organisms that cause Phytophthora root rot. Leaving the alleyways untreated, it might, it's not necessarily an issue for root lesion nematode, but we do have some data suggesting that it could be an issue for some of our fungal or fungal-like soil-borne pathogens. Another big concern that has been raised by growers is that if they utilize this practice, they're no longer able to make their own raised beds. And then on top of that, in a commercial, there are no tarp applications available through custom applicators. So if you're looking at a tarp, uh, Trident is not able to perform this for you. So let's go through these concerns a little more and look at some of the data in terms of you know, why I just stated what I stated. Um, the first question or first concern, will alleyways left untreated provide a refuge for nematodes? Here are some data that Tom and Inga have generated. Um, on this figure, we're looking at nematodes per 100 grams of soil. And then on our um, x-axis, we have various sampling points from spring 2011 to fall 2013. And we have various treatments. We have in blue, broadcast bed application, broadcast application, and our populations in the raised bed. In this pink, we have broadcast application, looking at populations in the alleyway. And then we have, in this green bars, bed fumigation with populations in the raised bed. And then purple, we have um, bed fumigation with populations of nematodes in the alleyways. And really what we're seeing is that in our alleyways, we don't see high populations, or we hardly see any populations of nematodes, either in broadcast or bed fumigation. We do see an increase in nematodes in the raised bed with our broadcast application. And then our bed, we see them increase over time. But again, it's quite different than our broadcast applications. So why, why do we think we see this? Well, one, rat, one explanation is that in the alleyways, growers are typically doing a pretty good job keeping those alleyways free of weeds or other types of plants. And there's really no roots growing there for nematodes to feed on. So because there's no roots for nematodes to feed on, it's really not an ideal place for root lesion nematode populations to establish. In addition, um, nematodes are microscopic or really small organisms. And for them to move from the alleyways into the raised bed, that's quite a long distance. So we really don't expect them to move that distance, just knowing a little bit about the biology of the nematodes. The next question is, same question, only for uh, fungal or fungal-like organisms like Phytophthora root rot. So this might be a concern if root rot is an issue in your field situation. What we have here on this figure is the proportion of disease roots on a zero to seven scale. And then we have our same sampling times as our first slide, or as a slide previously. And then we have um, are in blue, our bed fumigated plots, and in pink, our broadcast fumigated plots. And so what we see in our bed fumigated plots at certain time points, we see higher incidence or higher proportion of disease roots in the bed fumigated plots. And this might be just to, in terms of how the pathogen and the inoculum moves, can move in free water. So if you have a field site where root rot is a problem and it's prone to flooding, bed fumigation might not be the best option for you because that pathogen can move from untreated areas to your, to your raspberry plants. And another concern that's been raised, and I mentioned this, is the ability for a grower to make raised beds. Um, Trident Ag does have pretty large raised beds, but what I've learned over the years is each grower has a particular raised bed shape and dimension that they like. So if you're going to be going with bed fumigation, you are going to be uh, essentially st stuck with these bed dimensions. Um, and they do tend to be a little bit higher on average than typical raspberry raised beds. 
And then lastly, TARP versus untarped. Uh, so what we see here on this slide are nematodes in the, uh, per gram of root, and we have various sampling points, fall 2011 through fall 2012. Blue is our bed fumigated plots that are tarped, and pink is our bed fumigated plots non-tarped. And what I want to show, and we see this consistently in other trials and in other production systems, that when we tarp, we're able to retain that fumigant, and we do a much better job controlling our pathogens. And these data show that for nematodes, for root lesion nematode in this trial. All right. And then the last question for growers, if I don't want to fumigate, what are my options? And unfortunately, I don't have a lot to present on this for those individuals that are grappling with this decision. Um, one option um, is solarization. However, in trials that have been done previously, we have seen variable and inconsistent results in Northwest Washington. Uh, Jack Pinkerton had done some earlier trials and he found that Phytophthora or root, the root rot organism is killed at 222 hours at 84 degrees Fahrenheit. And then Tom had done some trials here in Skagit County where he looked at soil temperature under solarization and found that at 18 inches depth, he was not able to achieve that temperature for that window of time. And also this was a nursery trial, solarization did not increase cane yield. Some other reports we went through, uh, solarization we observed can be effective when combined with raised beds and amendments like riddle mill, fungicides, or gypsum, but that was in southwest Washington and in Oregon, where we're more likely to get those higher temperatures to control these organisms up in northern, northern parts of Washington, like Skagit and Whatcom County, this is going to be a bit more challenging to achieve temperatures that kill both Phytophthora and root lesion nematode. Another potential option that we've explored is brassica seed meal. Uh, brassica seed meal is a byproduct of oil extraction. There have been some really promising studies done in tree fruits and strawberries in terms of its ability to create suppressive soils. Um, and it is a, non uh, a, a fumigant alternative. A graduate student in my program, Rachel Rudolph, she did a trial where she applied 1.5 tons to the acre of this material in a field in northwestern Washington, and we monitored plant growth, and we monitored nematode populations. And unfortunately, we did not see the control that one would hope for with this alternative. Um, we, here on this figure, we're looking at mean populations of nematodes per gram of root, and it might be a little bit difficult to see, but this larger green bar, this is our brassica seed meal treated plots. Uh, next, we have um, plots that had roots removed and were fumigated at half the rate, and this was, the fumigant was BAPAM. Then we had our plots that were fumigated with the full rate of BAPAM, and then we had um, fumigated plots with no root removal. This fumigated one was with root removal. And really the trend is, and we saw this consistently over the times that we sampled, is that populations were highest in our brassica seed meal plots. They were lowest in both our fumigated plots at the high rate. The other thing that we, we've learned with brassica seed meal, um, it is an expensive material. And with this trial, one potential avenue to look at is that increasing the rates, we could see higher control of root lesion nematode, but that would mean more expensive and higher cost for growers. It's also limited in availability, and we found the application to be really challenging in a field situation just due to the physical nature of the material. So I'm gonna shift gears and talk about post-fumigation practices. i will spend quite a bit of time talking about cover crops. So in 2014 and 2016, we looked at the role winter cover crops can play in kind of maintaining a reservoir or a bridge for nematodes from one planting of raspberry to the next planting of raspberry. And this really began when Tom selected, uh, um, took some root samples from various fields that we were working in, and Inga looked at the nematode populations, and we found what you'll see here is that wheat is a really good host for root lesion nematode, and that these cover crops could serve as a bridge of nematodes from one planting to the next. So we've initiated some various trials to look at um, 
how we can reduce this bridge effect to try to improve management of nematodes. In one trial that we have funded from the WSDA Special Crop Block Grant Program, we looked at modified winter cover cropping practices to see if this can reduce the bridge effect of root lesion nematode. We looked at different planting dates of the cover crop. Uh, this is a busy table, I know, but we looked at early planting, so this was right before fumigation occurred, and we looked at later planting of the cover crop, and this is two weeks after fumigation, and we looked at different timing of cover crop destruction. destruction. We looked at uh, January, and we looked at February. And then on top of that, we looked at whether or not if we included an insecticide, um, we used lanate in this, in this experiment, a, a systemic insecticide, would help improve control of nematodes in this field situation. Uh, long story short, we did not see an effect due to these management practices, unfortunately. So when we look at our populations of nematodes in the roots and in the soil, uh, this here is for wheat roots, and then here is for raspberry roots, and then we also looked at plant growth. We saw no effect throughout the course of this experiment. But that doesn't mean we're going to stop there and look at other options. So we, in fall of 2016, we initiated an experiment to look at different types of cover crops as alternatives to our traditional winter wheat cover crop to see if we can find a cover crop that is less suitable as a host for root lesion nematode. So these are the various cover crops that we're using in this experiment. This is planted in a field up in Northwest Washington. Um, our control, so to speak, is our winter wheat uh, bobtail, which we know to be susceptible to root lesion nematode parasitism. We also are looking at black oats and wheeler rye, which we know from some previous studies are moderately resistant. And then we also have a new cover crop, a tall fescue cultivar Jessup, where there have some been preliminary reports that this particular cover crop is not a good host for nematodes. So that's something to stay tuned to and see what we learn from this particular trial. Looking to the future, there are some other trials that are going to be initiated this year to see if we can try to improve nematode control in red raspberry. Uh, this is a project that Tom is leading and was just funded by the Washington Red Raspberry Commission. And here what we're looking at is to see if crop termination using a fumigant applied through the drip line after the last harvest can improve uh, fumigation efficacy and root lesion nematode control. So this is a practice that a lot of growers will utilize. Uh, this is something that strawberry growers in Florida use as they apply, again, this fumigant through the drip lines to destroy that crop and essentially remove the food source for the nematode, and then they come back and they fumigate or they treat thereafter. Uh, there's also vegetable growers in Washington that utilize this practice as well. So we're gonna be looking at this in various soil types to see if this is an option to improve control in raspberry. So I'm gonna wrap up the fumigation session of this talk, but I wanna point you to a resource that uh, Tom and Inga have worked at, and it's a fact sheet looking at pre-plant soil fumigation and alternatives in the red raspberry system. If there's uh, questions that you still have or resources, this is a good resource to turn to, and you can find it free uh, on my website. So now let's shift gears and talk, to, um, and talk about plant material selection or cultivar choice. As for a lot of systems or with a lot of planting situations, Genetics and resistance can be really powerful tools. Um, unfortunately, though, we're going to learn that we don't really have those tools available for red raspberry and root lesion nematode. And this slide here and this experiment demonstrates that. So in experiment 2010 and 2012, we looked at various cultivars of red raspberry in a field that had high populations of root lesion nematode, and we had plots that were fumigated which are the yellow or orange bars, and plots that were not fumigated, which are the pink bars. And what this figure shows, harvested fruit. And so what you can see from this figure is that we, if we didn't fumigate, we really didn't have a good yield. The nematodes really damaged this planting. And we also see is that there's really no genetic resistance to this organism. All plants, if they were not fumigated, we saw a significant yield reduction. And really, here's the visual evidence for that. Um, we have Cascade Bounty here on the, on the left and Meeker on the right. And on the top, these are non-fumigated plots. This is a really extreme situation, but 
This is what was observed. And on the bottom, we have our fumigated situation. Now let's focus on plant health and establishment. We really don't have a lot to say about this right now. Uh, really, the only thing that we can say is that when you get your plants in the ground, um, try to make sure that there's nothing to limiting their yield and productivity. But we are looking forward to some future research trials. Um, and we have a little bit of information to share just because we've had some questions over the year with some other trials that we've initiated. Um, one question is about the role alleyway cover crops can have on root lesion nematode populations. Uh, this is an area where Chris Benedict has been doing some research. And uh, again, Rachel Rudolph, a graduate student in my program, has been doing research on. We're looking at various cover crops um, as um, uh, ways to enhance soil health and provide some other benefits in red raspberry systems. And one of the questions that we get asked is, if we're planting these alleyway cover crops, if nematodes in those alleyway cover crops will lead to higher nematodes in the raised beds. So Rachel did an experiment. She established um, cover crops in fall of 2014 and fall of 2015. She looked at nine different cover crop species. And we looked at populations of nematodes both in the alleyways on the cover crop roots and in the raised beds. And really, we didn't see any relationship in terms of um, high populations in the alleyways leading to high populations in the raised beds. So, you know, they, are, they can be maintenance hosts for root lesion nematodes, but they really aren't moving to the raised beds and impacting raspberry growth and development. Looking forward into the future, we also have a trial that was uh, just funded and we're going to be putting it into the ground here at the research station in a matter of weeks. Uh, we're asking this question, if the amount of nitrogen impacts parasitism of root lesion nematode. Our thought being that if we're providing various levels of nitrogen, we're going to have different amounts of root turnover. And with higher root turnover, the plants might be more able to outcompete the parasitism from the nematodes. So we're going to be looking at a microplot trial here on the station where we have various treatments where we're inoculating plots with nematodes and we're looking at various levels of nitrogen in this experiment. And we also have a control where we have kind of a standard rate of nitrogen with no nematodes. So that's something to stay tuned to into the future. And then lastly, when we're looking forward to the future is we're looking at biodegradable mulches, and we're going to be starting a few trials here in this, and again, matter of weeks. Uh, really, we're looking at biodegradable mulches as a tool to help establishment of tissue culture plugs. Uh, we've done some preliminary trials with some grower cooperators up in Whatcom County and found that biodegradable mulches can really lead to a significant increase in tissue culture growth. Um, and so it's potentially a very promising tool. However, what brings us back to nematodes is that when we look at some of the trials that have been done in Canada with polyethylene mulch, a non-biodegradable mulch, is that um, the researcher, Eric Gabrant, found extremely high populations of nematodes under black plastic mulch. And the idea there is that when we're utilizing these black mulches, we're increasing the temperature in the root zone and this can lead to a higher reproduction factor of the nematodes and increase their populations. So in our future trials, we're going to be looking at this a little bit more closely to see if these tools, um, mulches in particular, increase populations of nematodes and if this is something we need to be concerned about moving forward into the future. Lastly, I want to spend some time talking about post-plant nematode management. We have a few options to consider here. Um, here is a list from WCU Pickle accessed in March 2017 at the various nematicides that are available for Washington red raspberry. Uh, really the only ones that I'm familiar with is Nemix and Vidate. Um, important thing about Vidate is uh, number one, it's limited in its availability. Just the, the plant that manufactured it here in the US has had some problems, so there's less Vidate available on the market. However, on the plus side, um, Recently, the label was changed due to some research that Tom and Inga had done, and Vitate now may be applied through drip systems. Um, also, this disclosure here, just I'm here to provide information, and mention of any of these product names or trade names is not an endorsement for them. I'm just here as a conduit of information. 
So one thing to remember, um, or what has been learned with the application of post-plant nematicides is that they really don't rescue a plant from a nematode damage. So if you're a grower, you sample your soils uh, in your raspberry field and you find that you have high nematode populations, applying a nematicide based on research done to date will not rescue that planting. And this figure here shows that, um, here we're looking at fr fr uh, fresh fruit weight and various cultivars. And what was done in this experiment is that the nematodes were, were essentially killed but through treatment. Um, they were treated and non-treated. And what we found 15 months after treatment is that we really didn't see the plants increase their yield or reset themselves after the nematodes were eradicated. And it's likely due just to the carbon dynamics of a perennial plant. Once we have damage due to nematodes, it's really hard for that plant to reset itself, even if you eradicate or mostly eradicate those nematodes. However, there are some good applications that um, arise in for these nematicides in a post-plant situation. Like this is um, based on some research done in 2012 and 2014, where Tom and Inga have looked at the application timing of Vitae on non-bearing raspberry plants. And what they see, and I want to point you to these two figures here, Wakefield and Meeker, is that well, let me take a step back. So we're looking here at Wakefield, we're looking at mean populations of root lesion nematodes in the roots, and we have various uh, timing of treatment application, June, May, and a control where there was no nematicide added. Um, Wake, this Wakefield field was a high pressure field. When we look at Meeker, it's the same treatment, but if you look at the axis, it's a low pressure field. And what we see when we compare these two figures is that in this high pressure field, even with the application of Vitate here, we really didn't get the same treatment effect or control as we did in this low pressure field. So Vitate and some of these nematicides are a good option and they are likely to be more effective in low density fields as opposed to higher density fields like this where we really didn't see the efficacy that we did in the low density fields. All right, so that is the production cycle of a red raspberry field. Again, we stopped at various time points to think about what are the decisions as a grower or a crop advisor that we have to make about management of root lesion nematode. Again, I wanna acknowledge the people that have been involved from the very beginning of this research. Uh, this is Inga Zazada, the nematologist, Jerry Weiland, he'll be hearing from here shortly with his research on Phytophthora. Tom Walters, who you've already heard from, and then myself, again, a late arrival to the, this research and this station. And then also I wanna acknowledge again, the many people that were involved, uh, both in the field, collecting data in the lab or funding. Uh, so we have Sean and Amy, these are the technicians in both of our programs. Uh, Chris, Benedict, Rachel Rudolph, the graduate student, our numerous undergraduates and our grower cooperators that have helped us out. Mentioned these people at the very beginning, but it's worth mentioning them again. The Red Raspberry Commission, Trident Agricultural Products, CHNS has helped us find a lot of field sites and cooperators, and then several of our funding agencies um, beyond the Red Raspberry Commission, uh, the WSDA Special Crop Block Grant Program, the USDA CARE Program has helped fund some of our root removal trials, and the Northwest Center for Small Fruits Research that has also funded some of these root removal trials. So then I want to thank you for your attention and turn it over to questions if you have any. Yeah. 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 So the question was, is what is the limitation to applying a tarp? And you know, I'm going to, I don't want to put you on the spot, Tom, um, but he's really been was leading those particular trials. And my understanding of the situation is that Trident does not have a rig to custom apply and apply these tarps. Um, however, you know, in some of these trials, if you have an endorsed mint on your pesticide application, you can apply a tarp. But again, I kind of want to put Tom on the spotlight since he's been leading those particular trials and see what his comments are. That's okay. Yeah. They do. They do work a lot better. Mm -hmm. And you know, the way I understand it is that uh, Trident wants to keep the cost of the application mm -hmm. down. And 
and um, they realize that for, for a lot of our growers, um, they're not going to be happy with the additional cost of buying the tarp and then the additional cost and logistics of removing and disposing of the tarp. So it's not familiar to them. And so I think that's the motivation behind it. It is an extra bit of hardware to apply the tarp. It also makes it tougher for the tight end to make the application because you have to have at least one extra person there on site to cut off the tarp at the end of the pole. And uh, the machine will not run nearly as fast when it's laying the tarp as it does when it's not laying the tarp. So it makes it more complicated from the point of view of the custom deviator as well. That being said, from the standpoint of the medical control, we know it helps a lot. Yeah. Thank you, Tom. Off site locations, are there questions? Are ecto and endo ne nematodes treated the same? Um, good question. A lot of these products, again, with the 1,3-D, they're effective against nematodes. So I would expect similar efficacy for ecto versus endo nematodes. The challenge with the endo nematodes, root leaf nematodes that we focused on, is that, again, they spend the majority of their life, 70%, in the roots. That makes managing them a little bit more difficult because again they're not in the soil where some of our management practices like our nematicide would be treating them right. yes absolutely um, you know, that, that question kind of reminded me of some of the work that Inga and mm -hmm. Jack had done mm -hmm. um, they went through a lot of potential nematicides that yeah. worked pretty well on ecto mm -hmm. uh, Mm -hmm. And one by one, they found that they did not work when you had a plant in the system. But most of those nematodes, uh, in, most of those nematicides don't make it into the root mm -hmm. and kill the nematodes that live in the root. Right. And the only big exception to that is by it. Mm -hmm. Excellent point, Tom. Thank you. Sure. So, so Tom's comment was that uh, there had been some trials looking at various nematicides, and a lot of those really, they're not being taken up into the root, so they're limited in their efficacy because, again, root lesion nematode is an endoparasite, it's within the roots, the exception being vitate. Brian. Right, so the, the question was dagger nematode. Uh, is that concern? Have we found it? There are some populations in the Pacific Northwest, but they're not nearly as pervasive as root lesion nematode, which is why we're focusing on root lesion nematode in this talk. Mm -hmm. Right, exactly. And that kind of goes back, when we look at the action thresholds at the very beginning, um, dagger nematode, if you're finding dagger nematode, the action threshold um, is very different and the screen blank now, in this, because of the fact that it vectors a virus. Let me look here. That was some of Fred McElroy's, McElroy's recommendations. Go through here. Yep, there you go. Yep. So again, your action threshold is a lot lower for dagger in part because of the the ability of that to transmit virus yeah i don't know i haven't seen those data i 
Tom, a viewer. I don't, yeah, we haven't heard that. I don't know how founded that is. Yeah. Well, I'm going to, oh, I think there's one more question. Yeah. Is there anything coming? Really, um, so there are research trials being done when we're looking at post-plant nematocyte options. Inga has been looking at various products. Um, I haven't seen anything promising on the horizon from some of the data that she's generated. In fact, I have a, a slide with various compounds that shows that, sorry, I really am, uh, the screen's completely blank, so I'm a little handicapped. I didn't include this in the presentation just due to time considerations. But when it comes to, to post-plant nematicides, we really don't see a lot of options on the horizons when we look at various compounds. Um, plant health management, uh, going back, the best recommendations that we have right now is to, you know, Number one, try to fumigate or treat effectively prior to planting. And number two, try to manage your planting so there's nothing that limits its yield, so it's better able to outcompete nematodes. Um, we do have some trials on the horizon, so I would suggest stay tuned because we might have some more information in the coming years. Yeah. I'm going to turn it over to Jerry Wyland, and thank you for your attention. I'll take off my nematology, plant pathology hat. Um, and talk about more fertilizer later on this afternoon. Thank you.